Dr. Grudem is a research professor of theology and biblical studies at Phoenix Seminary in Phoenix, Arizona. He received a bachelor's degree from Harvard University and an MDiv and DD from Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, a PhD in New Testament from the University of Cambridge in England. He's published over 25 books, including Systematic Theology, which I believe just about every student at Biola has read over the course of their time here. He's also the general editor for the ESV Study Bible. He is a past president of the Evangelical Theological Society, a co-founder and past president of the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, and a member of the Translation Oversight Committee for the English Standard Version of the Bible. To welcome Dr. Grudem. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, Biola students and faculty and friends. It's good to be here. I want to talk about theistic evolution from the standpoint of what the Bible teaches about the creation of the world and the creation of living things in the world. And I'm going to argue that theistic evolution, as it is now proposed, denies 12 creation events and undermines crucial doctrines. I want to say at the beginning, from a theological, biblical standpoint, just to clear the ground a little bit, our book is not about the age of the earth. We take no position on that question, nor do we discuss it in the book. Our book is not about whether supporters of theistic evolution are genuine Christians. They are. Many of them make a genuine sincere profession of faith in Christ as their Lord and Savior. <clears throat> but the question that we have to ask with regard to evolution and the Bible is whether Genesis 1 to 3 is a historical narrative in the sense of reporting events that the author wants readers to believe actually happened rather than being figurative or theological literature. And that's the question. or Figurative or allegorical literature, excuse me. Um, Steve Meyer gave a very thorough and helpful definition of different, me different meanings that can attach to the word evolution. I'm going to assume that background of understanding and then go to this simpler condensed one sentence definition that the editors of the book uh, worked on together in conference call and agreed on that this is the form of theistic evolution that is becoming very persuasive in the evangelical world and it's the form of theistic evolution that we are most concerned about. That is this, the view that God created matter, and after that, God did not guide or intervene or act directly to cause any empirically detectable change in the natural behavior of matter until all living things had evolved by purely natural processes. So God created matter, and then matter just acted according to its ordinary properties, they will say God sustained matter in acting in those ways, sustained it so it maintained its existence and maintained its ordinary properties, but God didn't alter in any way the ordinary properties of matter, but it just randomly mutated over time until um, all of you came to be in the audience tonight. But the implications of this are serious. It means that all living things, including human beings, have come about not through direct creation by special activity of God, but by random mutation from previous simpler life forms. And that means, as far as human beings are concerned, that we have descended... That it means that God didn't directly create Adam and Eve, as the book of Genesis tells us, but rather that we have descended from earlier ape-like creatures by virtue of random mutation and natural selection. In addition, theistic evolution advocates today say that modern genetic studies tell us that we can't have all dis that the diversity in the human race shows that we can't have all descended from an original couple, but we've descended from about 10,000 early humans. And so um, the human race today has descended not from two people, but from about 10,000 early human beings. Ann Gager is going to talk about that question in more detail. On the BioLogos website promoting theistic evolution today, some authors, such as Dennis Lamoureux, say maybe there never was an Adam and Eve, or Adam and Eve never existed. Others say there was a literal Adam and Eve, but who were they? 
Well, there were just two individuals that God chose. He picked out of the 10,000 human beings who were on the earth, and he just decided to choose one and say, well, you're Adam, and choose another one and say, well, you're Eve. And then those were the representatives of the human race uh, because God had chosen them from among the 10,000 on the earth at that time. What happens then to Genesis 1 to 3? Well, as we worked on this, we realized that if you adopt this view of theistic evolution, it denies, undermines, or in fact denies 12 events in Genesis. And I'm going to read these. First, this view, this theistic evolution view, tells us that Adam and Eve were not the first human beings, and perhaps Adam and Eve never existed. Number two, that Adam and Eve were not created without parents, but they were born from human parents, from some human beings among these 10,000 human beings on the earth. It means that God did not act directly or specially to create Adam out of dust from the ground. God did not directly create Eve from a rib taken from Adam's side. Adam and Eve were never sinless human beings because, uh, number six, Adam and Eve didn't commit the first human sins. Human beings were doing morally evil things, selfish things, violent things, long before Adam and Eve came on the scene. Number seven, human death did not begin as a result of Adam's sin, for human beings existed long before Adam and Eve, and uh, they were always subject to death, just as we are subject to death today. So these, these 10,000 human beings that were on the earth were like us, they were subject to death. Number eight, not all human beings have descended from Adam and Eve, for there were thousands of other human beings on the earth at the time God chose two of them as Adam and Eve. Number nine, God did not directly act in the natural world to create different kinds of fish and birds and land animals. Number 10, God didn't rest from his work of creation or stop any special creative activity after plants, animals, and human beings appeared on the earth because there wasn't any special activity, special creative activity of God. He was just allowing matter to randomly mutate and produce living things. Number 11, God never created an originally very good natural world in the sense of a world that was a safe environment free of thorns and thistles and similar harmful things. And number 12, after Adam and Eve sinned, God did not place any curse on the world that changed the workings of the natural world and made it more hostile to mankind. Well, my goodness, the result is that Genesis 1 to 3, according to theistic evolution, is figurative or allegorical literature, but it is not factual history. And I'm going to mention uh, quotations from three of the leading proponents of theistic evolution today. In the United States, the primary uh, proponent, modern proponent of theistic evolution is Francis Collins. He's now director of the National Institutes of Health, former director of the Human Genome Project. Those two positions mean that he has one of the, he's one of the most influential scientists in the entire world, and he's an evangelical Christian, I, I believe Southern Baptist. Um, founder of the Biologos Foundation that is promoting theistic evolution, author of the best-selling book, The Language of God. But he says, what about Genesis 1 to 3, Dr. Collins? He says, it's poetry and allegory. And then Dennis Alexander, he's a uh, biologist at Cambridge University in England and director or emeritus director of the Faraday Institute for Science and Religion at St. Edmunds College, Cambridge. And um, I should say I've talked to Dennis Alexander um, at length for, over a breakfast uh, once and then a couple of other times in, in briefer intervals. He's a member of the same Baptist church in Cambridge, England that Margaret and I attended when we, uh, when we lived there. And Steve, did you, were you at Eden Baptist? Yeah. So it's a, it's a Bible believe, and Doug? Yeah, <laughs> on the same church, uh, different times. But um, Dennis Alexander spent many years as a missionary overseas and is a warm-hearted evangelical Bible-believing Christian but when you ask him about Genesis 1 to 3 in his writings and in his personal conversation, he will say Genesis 1 to 3 is figurative and theological literature. Because when you have to deny all these events recorded in Genesis, you don't have any other alternative. And then John Walton, professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College and formerly a professor at Moody Bible Institute for 20 years, Walton says that Genesis 1 to 3 contains stories about archetypes, like they're like every man's stories. They're, they're not telling about specific individuals, Adam and Eve, they're talking about what all people are like, those stories. 
Genesis 1 to 3 talks about the nature of all people, not the unique material origins of Adam and Eve. Walton says the Bible does not really offer any information, any information about material human origins. The Bible doesn't say where human beings came from. I don't agree with those conclusions for uh, the following reasons. And what, what follows now, I'm going to give reasons why it seems to me that Genesis 1 to 3 must be understood as reliable historical narrative. Reliable because it's in the Bible, but historical narrative because there's evidence in the text of Genesis 1 to 3, and then there's evidence in the rest of the Bible that we have to take this as historical narrative, not just as figurative or allegorical literature. I don't have time to go into detail right now, but Genesis 1 to 3 itself has a narrative structure. No translation sets it all out as poetry in short lines, um, repeating or reaffirming similar ideas one after another as poetry is said. Now, a few verses, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, where God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You may have two verses that are set out in poetic form, but no translation sets out all of Genesis 1 to 3 as poetry. And it has certain features within the Hebrew text that indicate its narrative, not uh, poetic literature. Moreover, these chapters, and Genesis 1 in particular, are, are placed in the front of the Bible. And the macro structure, the overall arrangement of the Bible is historical. Genesis is the beginning. Revelation tells us about future events yet to come. And there's historical progress in, uh, in the Bible moving through it in the rest of the Bible. And so what we would expect at the first chapter of the first book of the Bible is a description of where everything came from, how it got to be, got, how it got to be here. Uh, a description of historical events. Then there are intertextual ties to later historical narratives. You have these genealogies, such as in Genesis 5, when you have the genealogy leads from Adam to Seth to other sons and daughters, which is, a, I'll just take a moment there to say this puzzle that people bring up, where, where, did, uh, where did Cain's wife come from? Um, do you think the author of Genesis really ever thought about whether that was a problem? I imagine he did. I suspect it was Moses. But the answer is right here. Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters. Maybe dozens, maybe more than that for all the years they lived. And uh, so, yes, Eve would, Cain would have, and uh, Seth would have had to marry a sister. The laws against incest didn't occur until uh, the Mosaic Covenant in the book of Leviticus in particular. And if you have the entire human race descended from Adam and Eve, you have no alternative but to have Adam and Eve's sons marry daughters so that you have everybody descended from the same original couple. There's no other alternative or you don't have the unity of the human race. So Adam had other sons and daughters, and then Adam, Seth, Enosh, Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and then the genealogy goes on in Genesis 11, from Shem descended Terah, and now we're to Abraham, and certainly Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are historical figures. And so there's an intertextual tie to the historical narratives uh, that lead into later his history. Third, there's a strong argument from the macro structure of Genesis. There's a phrase, these are the generations of, it occurs 11 times in Genesis. Some versions translate, this is the account of, Hebrew, Ela Toledoth, these are the generations of. And it these, this phrase introduces 11 sections into which the book of Genesis is divided. You have the introductory chapter one, and then you start in 2-4, these are the generations of the heavens and the earth, and then the book of the generations of Adam, the book of the generations of Noah, and then the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, then Shem, Terah, Isaac, oh, Terah, the father of Abraham, and then the generations of Isaac and the generations of Jacob, and that's the rest of the book of Genesis. Now, are Isaac and Jacob and Terah and Abraham historical figures? Are they portrayed as historical figures in the book of Genesis? Certainly they are. That's historical narrative. But this structure ties together the earlier chapters of Genesis with the later chapters. This also, chapter two, 
is historical narrative. It's presenting ev uh, uh, events that the author wants you to believe actually happened. And I should add that Matthew 1.1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, starts out with Biblos Geneseos, the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, echoing the Septuagint translation, these are the generations of, I think Matthew is intentionally echoing and connecting to those, that macro structure of Genesis and saying, here's more of the same history. Number four, 10 New Testament books reaffirm the historicity of specific details in Genesis 1 to 3, and I'm going to read through these. Matthew 19, he who created them from the beginning, this is Jesus speaking, made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Now the therefore in Genesis 2.24 that Jesus is quoting refers back to the previous verse where God created Eve from a rib taken from Adam's side. And the therefore shows why a man shall hold fast to his wife it's a desire to reunite what had been separated, to reunite in the one flesh union of marriage what God had separated when he took Eve from Adam's side. In other words, by referring to, by quoting the therefore and saying that God said it, Jesus is affirming the historicity of the creation of Eve from Adam's rib. Otherwise, the therefore doesn't make sense in the, in the, uh, in the text. Luke traces gene Jesus' genealogy back to the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. The book of Acts, Paul says to the pagan Greek philosophers in Athens, the God who made the world and everything in it, not just matter, and matter created everything else, but God made everything in the world. And in fact, he made from one man, not 10,000 human beings, he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. Romans, sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. This is Adam, the one man that Paul refers to in the book of Acts. Many died through one man's trespass. By the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. 1 Corinthians, man was not made from woman, but woman from man. That's directly affirming the creation of Eve from Adam's rib in Genesis 2. As by a man came death, 1 Corinthians 15. The first man, Adam, 1 Corinthians 15. The first man was from the earth, the man of dust, 1 Corinthians 15. More affirmation of historical details in Genesis 1 to 3. Second Corinthians, the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning. Colossians, by him all things were created, not just matter, but all things in the creation were made. First Timothy, Adam was formed first, then Eve. Again, a reference to the details in the book of Genesis. Adam was not deceived, the woman was deceived and became a transgressor, reaffirming the narrative of the fall in Genesis 3. Hebrews, God rested on the seventh day from all his work. There was a distinction between God's work in creation and his resting from that work after it was done, a distinction that theistic evolution denies. And then the book of Revelation, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And then Revelation 10, affirming that God created the earth and what is in it, and the sea and what is in it, all the fish, in other words. Specific creation by God. So in order to accept theistic evolution, here is the price you have to pay. You have to say that Matthew is wrong, and Luke is wrong, and the book of Acts is wrong, and Romans is wrong, and 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Colossians, and 1 Timothy are wrong, and the book of Hebrews is wrong, and the book of Revelation is wrong, we have to say that 10 New Testament books are wrong in treating Genesis 1 to 3 as truthful historical narrative. And we have to say that Jesus himself was wrong to say that events in Genesis 1 to 3 actually happened. It's too big a price to pay. It's too big a price to pay. It is not acceptable as a legitimate alternative for Bible-believing Christians to hold to theistic evolution. Moreover, and for shortness of time, I can't go into all of these, but I have in my chapter in the book, 11 Christian doctrines that are undermined or denied by theistic evolution. I'll just mention a couple. First one is the truthfulness of the Bible. Theistic evolution is a challenge to the truthfulness of the three foundational chapters of the entire Bible and to the truthfulness of 10 of the 27 books of the New Testament. Proponents of theistic evolution, 
it, it's, it's important to recognize what is actually happening here. Proponents of theistic evolution are claiming, in essence, that there are whole areas about, of human knowledge about which they will not allow the Bible to speak with authority. They will allow the Bible to speak to us about salvation, but not about the origin of all living things on the earth, not about the origin of human beings, the origin of moral evil in the human race, the origin of human death, the origin of natural evil in the world, the perfection of the natural world as God originally created it. Christ's own personal involvement as the creator of all things in heaven and on earth, vis visible and invisible. These are massive areas of human knowledge affecting our outlook on our entire lives. Yet theistic evolution has decreed that these topics are the exclusive domain of modern naturalistic science off limits for God to speak to us about. In response, John Walton said, well, this doesn't affect inerrancy. It doesn't affect inerrancy. You're denying the truthfulness of the historical narrative in Genesis 1 to 3 and the truthfulness of 10 New Testament books and you're not affecting inerrancy? My goodness, you certainly are. Um, I'm going to skip over a number of these, but three and four are very important. Um, Theistic evolution denies the overwhelming evidence for God's existence that is found in nature. Romans 1, 19 to 20 says that the, the evidence of God's existence is so clear in nature that they are without excuse. But the theory of evolution gives people an excuse. Whereas they ought to look at the wonder of living creatures and say there must be a powerful, infinitely intelligent God who created these plants, these animals, these human beings. They ought to say there is a God to whom I'm accountable. But theistic evolution or any form of affirming evolution gives people, I shouldn't say theistic evolution, the belief in evolution generally in society gives people an excuse by which they no longer have to say I'm accountable to God. And therefore evolution in believing it and accepting it undermines evangelism and is a, maybe the major barrier to evangelism in our world today because people don't have an instinctive sense. They have an excuse for not being shaken by this instinctive, instinctive sense that there's a God who created me and to whom I, I'm accountable. Well, that's the price that has to be paid for accepting theistic evolution. My conclusion is that the theistic evolution denies the historicity of 12 creation events. It undermines 11 significant Christian doctrines. It's incompatible with belief in the truthfulness of the Bible and with several Christian doctrines of the Christian faith, crucial doctrines of the Christian faith. So in my opinion, theistic evolution should not be allowed as an alternative explanation that is a legitimate one in evangelical churches, college, colleges, and seminaries. And I'm thankful that uh, Biola affirms that conclusion as well. Thank you. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything, from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.